A hash table is a data structure that stores elements as key value pairs, allowing you to use the key to efficiently retrieve information about its corresponding value. Here in this example, we have some keys representing names, Alice, Bob, and Oscar, and their corresponding university IDs as their values. If we want to retrieve the ID of, say, Bob, we can use Bob as the key to efficiently access his ID. In practice, we use something called a hash function, which takes the key as input and returns the location where the corresponding value is stored. In practice, this is implemented using arrays. Let's consider an array of size 8, with indices ranging from 0 to 7. We'll use a hash function that takes the key and performs a modulo operation with the size of the array, which in this case is 8. For simplicity, let's assume the key is a positive integer. Now, let's insert a key value pair with the key 12 and the value Alice. We'll pass the key 12 into our hash function, and the output of the hash function will determine the index of the array where the value Alice will be stored. Here, the output is 4 which means we need to store this key value pair at index 4 of the array. Next, let's insert the value Bob with the key 10. Passing the key 10 into the hash function gives an output of 2. This means we need to store the key value pair at index 2 of the array. Next, let's insert the value Oscar with the key 8. Passing the key 8 into the hash function gives an output of 0. This means we need to store this key value pair at index 0 of the array. Next, let's insert the value Vivek with the key 2. This one is interesting because when we pass the key 2 through the hash function, it gives the index 2. However, index 2 is already occupied, so we can't store the value there. This, ladies and gentlemen, is known as a collision. A collision occurs when the index provided by the hash function is already occupied. There are multiple ways to handle collisions. First, let's understand how chaining helps deal with collisions. Let's use the same 8-sized array as an example. Suppose we insert the value A with the key 4. If you perform the modulo 8 operation, you get the index 4. So we need to store this value at index 4. However, instead of directly storing it at index 4, we use a linked list to store the value at that index. Now, if we store another element with the key 12, the hash output would again be 4, resulting in a collision. To handle this, we add the new element to the end of the linked list at index 4. If you're unfamiliar with how a linked list works, you might want to check out our video on linked lists. The link is in the description box below. Other elements will be inserted similarly, creating a new linked list at each index. When a collision occurs, the element is appended to the end of the linked list at that index. Now, deleting an element works in a similar fashion. Let's delete the element with the key 12. First, the index is calculated by passing the key through the hash function. Then, the key is searched within the linked list at that index. Once the element is found, it is deleted, and the next pointer of the previous node is updated to point to the next node, effectively removing the element from the linked list. Now, insertion and deletion in a hash table are generally constant time operations on average if the hash function is effective. However, if too many keys collide, the operations can degrade to linear time in the worst case. Now, let's look at another collision handling technique called open addressing. In this method, we'll first explore a strategy known as linear probing. In linear probing, when a collision occurs, we try to find the next available slot to insert the element. For example, if index 4 is already filled, we move to the next index, 5. Since index 5 is empty, we insert the element there. Next, if a key is hashed to index 4 again, we check the next slot. In this case, index 5 is already filled, so we continue searching until we find the next available slot. Here, index 6 is empty, so we insert the element there. The formula for linear probing is hash of the key plus the loop variable i and then take modulo with the size of the array. This ensures that if i goes out of range, it wraps around to the earlier positions in the array. Now, the disadvantage of linear probing is that it can form clusters of elements near each other, which makes the operations inefficient. Let's move on to another technique with an open addressing called quadratic probing. In quadratic probing, instead of searching for an empty slot in a straight line, we search in a quadratic pattern. 
The formula is similar to the one we used earlier, but here we use i squared instead of just i. Here we have an element with the key 1. If we take the modulo 8 of it, we get 1. So let's insert it at the first index. And the next element with the key 2 will go to index 2. Now let's insert the element with the key 9. The hash output would be 1, but index 1 is already occupied. So we apply the formula to find the next available slot. Using the formula, we take the hash value 1 and the variable i equals 1. Substituting into the formula gives the result 2. But index 2 is also occupied. In the next iteration, we increase i to 2 and calculate again. This time, the formula gives the result 5. Index 5 is empty, so we insert the element at index 5. This technique works well for larger arrays. However, if you observe the pattern, you'll notice that in the next iteration, it can go back to an already visited index, like index 2, and get stuck in a cycle. Double hashing can solve the issue of cycles, so let's look at how this technique works next. The idea in double hashing is that if a collision occurs, instead of probing in a linear or quadratic sequence, we use a second hash function to determine the step size for the next probe. This ensures a more scattered and independent probing sequence, reducing clustering and avoiding cycles. Here, m represents the array size, which is 8 in our example. A common second hash function used in double hashing is t p minus key modulo p. Here, p is a prime number smaller than the size of the array. In our example, we'll take p equals 5. This second hash function ensures the step size is independent, helping to avoid clustering and cycles. Let's insert an element with the key 2. The hash output is 2, and since index 2 is empty, we'll insert the element there. Next, let's insert the element with the key 10. The hash output is 2, so it should be placed at index 2. But since index 2 is already occupied, we'll use double hashing. First, we calculate the second hash function using 10 as the key. The output is 5. Now, we plug this into the formula, where the first hash value is 2, i equals 1, and the second hash output is 5. This gives us an output of 7. So we will check if index 7 is empty. It is empty, so we will insert the element there. Next, in one last example, let's insert a value with the key 18. The hash output is 2, so it should go to index 2. But since index 2 is already occupied, we calculate the second hash function using the key 18. The output is 2. Now, using the formula with the first hash value 2, i equals 1, and the second hash output 2, we get 4. We check if index 4 is empty. It is, so we insert the value there. That's how double hashing works. The time complexity of all operations in a hash table is constant time on average. However, in the worst case, it can degrade to linear time if there are too many collisions. But this scenario is rare with a good hash function and a well-designed table. Check out the GitHub link in the description for a simple Python implementation of this.